take a minute and look around this space. Think about how it makes you feel. And I mean, think about how it really makes you feel. How do you feel in spaces? Do you even notice, generally speaking, how you feel in spaces? Do you understand why you feel the way you feel in space? I've come to understand that the buildings and the environments that we spend our days in have a significant impact on our physical and mental health. Buildings can affect us and spaces can affect us in positive ways and in negative ways. And when design is done right, it can have a positive effect on human health. I'm going to talk to you today about three things, active design, biophilic design, and something called circadian rhythm to help you become more aware of your environments and help you make the right choices so that you can improve human health through your, the buildings that you spend your days in. But first, perhaps a brief introduction is in order. As a child, I developed an attachment to architecture, literally. <laughs> My father was with the federal government, like many people in the Washington, D.C. area, and so we moved to a new post in a new country about every four years. So consequently, I was exposed to many different cultures and the spaces that represented those cultures. I gradually understood that I did feel differently in different spaces. I felt small and insignificant in a large church. I would feel cool just from the sound of the water in Paxhahan Falls in the Philippines. I developed a love of mazes. There's a family story, actually, about me being lost in the maze at Hampton Court in England just as the tour bus that we were riding in was leaving the site and all hell broke loose as my parents tried to find me. For, for the record, I was not lost. I was sitting in the center uh, and I was having a lovely time. <laughs> so when we moved back to the States for good, there was no question that I was going to study architecture. I've been a practicing commercial architect for the past 32 years, the last 17 of them, in Arlington. About 10 years ago, I went to a program that showed how our individual genetics and our genes are triggered by environmental factors, sometimes in good ways, but sometimes in bad ways, resulting in serious diseases, things like Parkinson's disease and certain cancers. And I realized that I really had no idea how my body worked. And I realized how disconnected I was from my body and from my environment. And I was horrified. I, here I am, a trained professional. I'm an architect, right? Architecture is supposed to be the platform for civilization, the thing that we create family and community and industry. And I didn't know if the buildings that I was designing, schools and grocery stores and even health clinics, were having a positive effect or a negative effect on the people that were using them. So I spent the last 10 years reading and researching and talking with people about how our bodies interact and how human neurobiology intersects with the design of built environments. So that we can all have a greater awareness of what we're doing in space and make the right choices. It's all part of a culture shift, because the hardest thing to do is to change behavior. I think anyone who's ever bought a gym membership and then never gone back understands that. <laughs> so I've come to learn about something called salutogenic design, which literally means the creation of health. Salutogenic design are measures that you can take in a built environment that actually have a positive impact on human health. Wellness is more than putting a yoga room or a bike rack in a space, although those are good things. Wellness really enables people to function at the highest levels of human performance possible. Let me repeat that. Because human health is not the absence of disease, it's about enabling people to function at the highest levels of performance possible. How many of you are wearing a Fitbit or some biometric device? Well, you're already part of our first concept, which is active design. Active design encourages activity in the spaces in the nat as a natural extension of how we use them. Humans actually evolved to run five to nine miles a day. Just to give you a feel for what that is, five miles would be if we all got up from this auditorium right now and ran to RFK Stadium all the way down the mall. That's five miles. That's the shorter distance. The longer distance, the nine miles, would be if we got up and ran to Tyson's Corner. Instead, today we spend 87% of our time indoors, 47% of that time is in front of screens. So we are obviously not using our bodies the way that they were engineered to be used. We have to get more active in space because we now understand the connections between a sedentary lifestyle, sedentary meaning sitting in a chair behind a desk all day, and chronic disease. 
There's a concept actually making its way through the design community now called sitting disease. And I can tell you a little bit about what it entails. After sitting for 30 minutes, the muscles in the lower half of our body turn off, blood moves more sluggishly, and it leaves fatty deposits in our veins, which is the beginning of heart disease. Our metabolism drops 90%, good cholesterol drops 20%, our neck and our spine uh, become more compressed. Everybody's shifting around in their seats right now. You know? <laughs> so active design breaks the links between sedentary behaviors and chronic disease. Active design also makes us smarter. There's been research done at the Salk Institute that shows that 30 minutes a day of regular exercise results in a 15% increase in the neurons in the part of the brain that deals with learning and memory. So when you're being active, you're not only being good from a physical standpoint, but you're also creating benefits for your brain. You're creating new neuronal and memory pathways. Think of it this way, activity equals memory. So what are some of the strategies that we can employ when we're in space? that helps us live out this active design. Well, again, it's got to be an extension of your natural daily activities or else you're not going to do it. So think about walking to metro or bike to work. And once you get to work, use the stairways instead of the elevators. Try having a standing or a walking meeting instead of a sitting one. Use active furniture, things like sit-stand desks or a treadmill desk or a stability ball that you can sit on instead of a regular chair. But it doesn't have to be anything complicated. It can be something as simple as setting your device for regular intervals to remind you to get up and get out. Getting out takes us to our second concept, which is called biophilic design. So I talked about us running five to nine miles because we evolved as hunter-gatherers and later farmers until the Industrial Revolution, when most of us came inside for most of the day. But we still have an evolutionary memory. Biophilia means the love of living things or living systems. And that evolutionary memory actually has a calming effect on our neurobiology. So back to nature isn't just a clever idiom. We actually have a mind-body connection to nature that helps lower our blood pressure and reduce the stress hormones that live in our bodies. Natural elements, nature itself, natural materials, things like stone and wood and plants actually lower our blood pressure. It also helps to restore our attention. So think about it this way. There are times when I'm working on a problem, and I'll be so focused and concentrated on that problem um, that I'll be working and working and working. And I realize at a certain point that I stop making progress. I get crabby. I get irritable. I'm, you know, patience shrinks. And I realize that I'm wrapped around the axle, and I'm, and I'm going nowhere fast. And the solution to that is to get up and leave the problem, and in the best case, to go outside into nature. Nature allows us to calm the static in our minds Nature helps us to relax. Nature allows things to float back into our consciousness uh, in ways that actually help to solve the problem. It's called unconscious processing. So your brain keeps processing, even if you're not sitting in front of that problem, beating your head on the wall. It's the thing that accounts for all the aha moments you've ever had in the shower. So how do we address biophilia in space? Well, bring the outdoors in. It's pretty simple. Look for ways to put plants in the space that you occupy. Make sure that you have a view to nature. And we know that it doesn't even have to be a real view of nature. If there's a life-size photograph in your area, it has the same beneficial impact on your health as looking out a window. And easiest, easiest to employ, go outside. Get up, go outside. Even if it's only for five minutes, it restores your attention and restores your energy. How many of us are outside only long enough to go from our house to our car and our car to our office and then reverse it at the end of the day? And how many times do you come out at the end of the day and realize it's been a gorgeous day and you've missed the whole thing? That happens to me all the time. Which brings us to one of the best reasons to go outside, circadian rhythm. The most important act in nature is the sun's progress across the sky. Because of the way that our bodies and our brains are wired, it tells our bodies what to do. It creates something called circadian rhythms for our bodies. Circadian rhythms regulate the stability in our body systems. And we have an internal clock in our brain that helps to drive them. And that circadian rhythm, that internal clock, is governed by the sun. Because morning light is blue in color. It's generally imperceptible to the naked eye, but your circadian system reads it and gives you a shot of cortisol, and you're up, out the door, and on your way for the day. In the evening, evening light is yellow in color. Your body knows and starts winding down, starts preparing you for rest and relaxation, and releases the hormone melatonin, which helps you sleep. So when we're indoors, in a space like this, with no natural light, 
what's it telling our bodies? We're not getting the signals that we need in order to function correctly. But why does that matter? Well, it matters because we have now understand that there's a link between circadian rhythm disruption and chronic disease. Things you might not imagine, things like high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, uh, mood disorders, depression. These are my parents. My mother would kill me if she knew that I had this photograph of her. Up. <laughs> so we'll just keep it to ourselves. They, uh, they've been married for 63 years, and my dad turned 89 last July. He is a great guy. He's very warm, engaging. He's ridiculously silly for a man of his age. Uh, and he recently spent about 10 days in the hospital getting a pacemaker. Actually, he got two because the first one didn't work, so they had to operate again. During that time, I realized how he was not acting like himself while he was in the hospital. He wouldn't follow directions. He was alternately confused or angry. He was ornery, and it's just not like his temperament. After he was well enough to be released, they released him to a nursing home so he could build up his strength and stamina before going home. So I thought I would try an experiment while he was there. And every morning and every afternoon, I took him outside in his wheelchair, and we just sat and talked. Very shortly, within the matter of days, I noticed his normal, sunny, no, per no pun intended, personality coming back. He was himself again. His memory got better. He was, his body's were, uh, circadian rhythms were coming back. They were resetting themselves, and his body was back to the normal rhythms that it was used to. He was able to spend that time outside, and his body was able to get the signs that it was looking for from the sun. So how much time do we spend looking at devices? A lot. I heard somebody laugh. A lot. And what color is the light that comes out of devices? Blue. Excellent. First row. Excellent. Um, so it's literally telling our bodies that it's morning, because remember I said blue light is morning light. So when you're on your device late at night, and then you wake up at 4 in the morning, might be a correlation, huh? Or when you wake up in the morning and you're still dead tired, but you've been up late working on your device, again, there's a cause and effect there. So what do we do? Because we can't live without our devices, right? That would be impossible. How do we live with our devices and live this crazy lifestyle that we have without disrupting our circadian rhythms and our sleep patterns? Well, there are some things that we can do. We talked about having access to natural daylight. And it works whether you're in a space or outside. Any access to natural daylight helps your body keep up with where it is in the day and what it's supposed to be doing. There are apps out there as well that help you calibrate the color temperature of your device screens. I use one called Flux, which is F.LUX. You can Google it. It's online. It's free. And it works on a number of different platforms. And then most importantly, get off our devices. We need to get off, and that means no TV either, for a few hours before we go to sleep so that our bodies can start to turn themselves off and prepare for rest. So I want to leave you with an, uh, an example of what's happening right now, actually, in an Arlington school nearby, where they're actually incorporating and starting to um, design in some of these salutogenic measures. Some of you have probably heard of LEED building certification, which is something that seeks to improve environmental sustainability in buildings. There is also now a well building certification, which seeks to improve human health through the built environment by paying attention to the whole body. I have a coworker whose son goes to Oak Ridge. It's the most adorable picture. Um, and so she came to us and said, you know, there's a wellness council that's been started at Oak Ridge. It was started by, in 2014 by the Arlington County Public School System. And the idea was that this would be a pilot council so that if it worked, it would be ported to other schools and every school would have its own wellness uh, council. So she said, would you, do you think we could take a look at Oak Ridge and see what their physical plant looks like? And I said, sure. So my office sat down. We did a brainstorm, a pro bono, well-building assessment, and looked at things that they could incorporate now for very little money and things that they could work toward in the future. And they've started to incorporate them. So the Wellness Council started a GoFundMe site. And with the money that they raised there, it was matched by the PTA. And they were able to, to start by buying some furniture that helped get the kids a little bit more active in their classrooms. They bought stability ball seats, which helped the kids engage their cores as they were sitting. And they just looked like fun, actually. <laughs> they also bought sit-stand desks with trapeze bars. So you can see that little U-shaped bar under the desk itself. Little feet rest on that and can swing back and forth while they're working. And then last, they bought pedal desks, where they could work out a little bit of energy while they were still studying up top, like a duck. All the feet moving really fast down below, very calm up top. 
The good news is it's, even though this is just a first step, it's been a great success. You figured the kids would like it because it was something new. We also have a novelty neuron in our brains, so the kids are noticing that. But the teachers like it too. The teachers say it's been a great thing for their classroom. So much so that they're actually taking the furniture and they're moving it from class to class so that each class can have a try. The great thing is that the kids are starting to make connections between their behaviors and their health and understand that there's a connection there. OK, so now you know. That's it. That's the secret. Now you can put these practices into your life, and you can become part of a culture change. Because culture change, remember, is the hardest part. Talk to your family. Talk to your coworkers. Talk to any children that are in your lives. And talk to them about some of these measures. They're pretty simple, right? And after all, we teach our kids to look both ways before they cross the street, to wash their hands before eating, and to brush their teeth twice a day. If each of us here just remembers these three things, to get more active as a natural extension of your day, to find restoration in nature, and to get exposed to daylight, then we'll each be making a huge step forward in our own health, our community's health, and the health of our world. And so that some kids sitting in a maze somewhere, or near a waterfall, or even in their own backyard, starts to make the connections between their body, their environment, and their wellness. Thank you.